gigantic, weighing hundreds of tons. Secondly, very precise, scientific astronomical alignments. And thirdly, the greatest mystery of all, we don't know who built these monuments. We don't know when they were built, we don't know why they were built, and in most cases, we have absolutely no idea how they were built. Historians and archaeologists present us with a kind of sanitized view of the past. We're presented with a picture of the past as though everything's sewn up and sorted out and everybody knows exactly what's happened. But if you go into this in depth, as I have done, what you find is that these historical opinions are pure speculation. They're not based on solid evidence at all. A monument like this one, made of stone, cannot be dated by any conventional means. All you have are the opinions of scholars. And whether it's here in England or in Egypt or in South America, the problem remains the same. Massive, completely anonymous monuments about which we know nothing, around which historians and archaeologists have elaborated fanciful theories based on absolutely no evidence whatsoever. All that we know about the people who built these monuments is what we can deduce from the monuments themselves. And if we look at these monuments with open minds and open eyes, we find something very interesting. Firstly, that the level of technology involved in creating them was high, the lifting and maneuvering of these huge blocks of stone. And secondly, that they incorporated fantastically accurate astronomical alignments, which could only have been the result of a very accurate observational science. So this is what the monuments tell us. They tell us that the people who built them were serious and intelligent people with a scientific outlook on life. And that's the testimony of the monuments. And no matter what the historians or the archaeologists say, the monuments continue to tell us that story. Tourists come from all over the world to be photographed at Greenwich, standing astride the Prime Meridian with one foot in the Western Hemisphere and one foot in the Eastern Hemisphere, they know exactly where they are on the planet. The science of determining exactly where we stand on the planet is a relatively recent one. Prior to the 18th century, ships were constantly being wrecked on coasts because the navigators had no idea within a hundred miles to west or east of exactly where they were, and it led to the most horrendous uh, accidents and disasters. And what it took to overcome this problem was the invention of an extremely accurate marine chronometer, a timepiece that could keep accurate time at sea. This was the essential thing, and we didn't have such a chronometer until late in the 18th century. But the mystery that arises from this is that ancient maps have come down to us from thousands and thousands of years ago which incorporate astonishingly accurate longitudes and relative longitudes, placing, for example, the continent of South America and Africa in accurate relative longitudes, as accurate as we can manage today. Now, as far as our historians are concerned, this should not have been possible before the 18th century, and yet, these maps are testimony to an earlier civilization that was able to do longitudes as well as we can do them today. In 1929, rolled up on a dusty shelf in a library in Constantinople in Turkey, a map was found. This map had been drawn in 1513 by a Turkish admiral, Admiral Piri Reis, and he stated on the map that it was based on more than 20 source maps, and that some of these maps went back to the time of Alexander the Great, or even earlier, in other words, to before the time of Christ. The strange thing about this map is it shows features of the Earth that nobody in 1513, let alone thousands of years previously, should have been able to know. It shows Antarctica, and it shows South America and Africa in perfect relative longitudes. The map incorporates a high degree of geographical and scientific knowledge. And as Piri Reis himself told us, that knowledge was not his knowledge. It was knowledge that he borrowed and copied from earlier maps. So the mystery is, where did these source maps come from? Who charted the globe long ages ago with an accuracy that we ourselves can hardly match today? According to historians, 
uh, no map should have been able to incorporate accurate longitudes before the late 18th century. Yet these ancient maps show that it was done. And this is a fact that we're confronted with, whether historians like it or not. And confronted by that fact, we have to make certain deductions from it. And the, the clearest deduction of all is that whoever drew up those original source maps thousands of years ago had a level of technology as high as our own. They had explored the whole globe from north to south and from east to west. They knew the exact location of all the continents and land masses. And they were able to map them with precise, accurate longitudes, which we ourselves couldn't do until at least the 18th century. So this is testimony of an advanced and as yet unidentified civilization in remote prehistory. The Piri Reis map uh, definitely shows uh, the northern coastline of Antarctica, of the Antarctic uh, Peninsula, and, and perhaps the greatest mystery of all uh, is that it shows the Antarctic Peninsula, not as it looks today, covered by more than a mile of ice, but as it actually looks underneath that covering of ice. Now we ourselves have only known what the land under the Antarctic Peninsula really looks like since 1958 when seismic surveys were taken across the ice cap. And the mystery of this map is it shows Antarctica as it looks under the ice long before Antarctica is even supposed to have been discovered and the Piri Reis map isn't alone. It's one of a category of maps that focus on Antarctica. The famous uh, geographer Mercator in the 16th century provided us with an accurate map of Antarctica 300 years before Antarctica was discovered. And he too said that his information was based on earlier sources. Orontius Phineas provided a map of Antarctica showing mountains along the coast with rivers running down from those mountains into the sea in places where huge glaciers stand today. And perhaps the most amazing map of all was drawn by Philippe Bouache, a French cartographer in the 18th century, again based on earlier source maps, which gives us an almost perfect rendering of the whole continent of Antarctica as it actually looks underneath the ice. Now in this, there lies a great, great mystery. The implications of these maps are truly enormous. We're faced with one of two propositions. Geologists tell us that Antarctica has been covered with ice for at least three million years. This is the orthodox geological opinion. In that case, we're obliged to accept that Antarctica was mapped accurately more than three million years ago, when we ourselves, uh, as a species, are not even supposed to have existed on this planet. Alternatively, there's a possibility that the geologists are wrong. They've been wrong before, and it's possible that they're wrong about this. There's a growing body of extremely persuasive evidence which suggests that Antarctica may not have been covered with ice, and certainly not completely covered with ice, until 10 or 12,000 years ago, just a blink of the eye in terms of geological time, and, and well within the time span of human beings, just like ourselves. Let me tell you uh, a little story that will help to shed light on this. Back in 1916, uh, a geologist called Alfred Wegener proposed what was at the time considered to be an outrageous geological hypothesis. He said that it looked to him like the continents floated around on the surface of the earth over very long periods of time. It looked like West Africa and the east coast of South America fitted together like a kind of jigsaw puzzle. He proposed the theory of continental drift. Wegener was completely ridiculed by his colleagues in 1916. He was regarded and described as a madman. By 1960, the theory of continental drift was being taught as orthodox geology in all our schools. I tell you this story to illustrate that geology is about theories, and theories change in time. And sometimes what seem like outrageous theories get supported by later evidence. In 1953, another outrageous geological theory was proposed. It was proposed by a man called Charles Hapgood, a professor in America. And he suggested a very intriguing possibility, which is that the entire outer crust of the Earth, you know, we live on an 8,000-mile thick planet, and the crust, the hard crust of the Earth on which we all live is only 30 miles thick. According to Hapgood's theory, this crust of the Earth can sometimes slip in one piece 
around the core of the earth, rather like the loose skin of an orange moving around the fruit at the center of the orange. Now, interestingly enough, Hapgood's theory received an extremely strong endorsement at the time from one of the greatest minds of our century, Albert Einstein, who liked the physics of the theory. And I think if Einstein had lived, that we might have seen the theory of Earth crust displacement much more mainstream today than it actually is. But this theory explains how and why Antarctica could have been ice free as recently as 12 or 15,000 years ago. Quite simply, because at that time, the Antarctic continent was not positioned dead center within the Antarctic Circle as it is today, but was positioned further north, about 2,000 miles further north, according to Hapgood's and Einstein's evidence, and that a massive one-piece displacement of the crust of the Earth forced that continent southwards, dead center into the Antarctic Circle, and it was only then that the two mile and one mile thick ice cover that cover various parts of it today actually began to build up. It's just possible that as recently as 12 or 15,000 years ago, Antarctica wasn't covered by ice as it is today. The evidence is mounting to suggest that Antarctica hasn't always been where it is today, uh, that it has been shifted south into the polar latitudes where everything freezes. For example, they found fossilized forests in Antarctica. Now, you cannot grow a forest in a place that has six months of darkness a year, which Antarctica presently has. They've even found fossilized palm leaves there. In 1953, a very important but radical theory was advanced by Professor Charles Hapgood in the United States and immediately endorsed as to its physics by Albert Einstein, which provides an answer to all these mysteries. It suggests, quite simply, that the outer crust of the Earth can shift in one piece around the core in a dramatic and tumultuous movement that forces land masses into different latitudes, creating different climatic conditions on those land masses. A lot of people ask me uh, what I consider to be a very intelligent question about this issue of uh, relative uh, longitudes uh, and the accurate maps that have come down from, to us from the past. They say, if uh, the crust of the Earth shifted in one piece, as, as you're arguing, uh, how come these ancient maps are, are showing us the world uh, as, it, as it looks today? Shouldn't they be showing us it as it looked before the crustal displacement? I've gone into this in great depth, and I think there's an answer uh, to this question. What all the evidence uh, suggests very, very strongly uh, is that an, an attempt was made to fix, to remap the planet after the displacement of the crust, so that, so that these maps have come down to us from a time when that tremendous cataclysm of the displacement of the crust was over. I think these maps were done by the survivors of a civilization that was destroyed in the displacement of the crust, and that they sought to create again an accurate picture of the world that they now found themselves living in. The, uh, the issue of the displacement of the Earth's crust creates a, a problem in relation to the ancient maps because the maps uh, show us uh, accurate longitudes uh, as they are today. Um, but in that problem, uh, I think we find uh, also the solution uh, to the problem. We find actually a way of dating the epoch uh, in which these maps were drawn. Uh, the evidence suggests to me very strongly that these maps were drawn up after the displacement of the crust. They were an attempt by the survivors of a forgotten civilization to give themselves again a picture of the world that they were living in as, the, as, it, as they found it after this tremendous disaster had taken place. In my opinion, this whole mystery is closely tied up and interwoven with the mystery of the last ice age, and it really is a huge mystery. Everybody knows, we all learn it at school, that there was such a thing as an ice age. And uh, it's very clearly established in the geological record that, for example, North America was covered with ice more than two miles thick, as far south as the Mississippi Delta, almost into the tropics. This ice was stable for more than 50,000 years. And then suddenly, and relatively recently, 
15,000 years ago approximately, it all started to melt. And within just 2,000 years, that enormous mass of ice had completely melted down. Sea levels went up four or 500 feet around the world. No geologist has ever been able to explain why this happened, why the Ice Age ended so suddenly. But perhaps the answer lies in the theory of Earth crust displacement. Perhaps the reason that North America was covered with that mass of ice was because at that time it was situated much more closely to the North Pole than it is today. It was then shifted south into warmer latitudes by a displacement of the crust, and that would explain, naturally, why all that ice melted so rapidly, because it was in a much warmer climate. The theory of Earth crust displacement uh, actually explains many mysteries. It explains why there was a last ice age, it explains why the ice suddenly melted, and it explains also a very great mystery indeed, which is why we find literally flash frozen um, over large areas of northern Siberia and northern Canada, uh, enormous quantities of carcasses of mammoths and other large mammals which appear to have been hit by some kind of gigantic cataclysm. The evidence suggests that that cataclysm was a displacement of the crust which forced some areas of the northern hemisphere south. It was a kind of swiveling turning of the outer crust of the earth. And while some parts of the northern hemisphere were shoved south, other parts which had been in relatively warm latitudes were shoved north, much closer to the North Pole and almost literally overnight. This is the only theory that I've come across which can explain these hundreds of thousands of carcasses of basically warm weather animals very close to the North Pole today. All in, in a kind of zone of death all over uh, the northern hemisphere, northern Siberia and northern Canada, we find the frozen carcasses of hundreds of thousands of large mammal species, mainly mammoths, but also woolly rhinos and other creatures of this kind. And when their stomach contents uh, are examined, as they have been, they're found to have been grazing on warm weather vegetation, and yet they're now positioned extremely close to the North Pole. The only theory which really explains this mystery is the theory of crustal displacement, that the land that they were on was shoved into a much colder climate very suddenly. Charles Hapgood is one of the great unsung geniuses of our time. He was a man who had the courage to follow the evidence where it led him and to put forward conclusions from that evidence that were coherent, solid, imaginative, and clear, even though those conclusions were totally at variance with the opinion of the historical and geological establishment of the time. To put it simply, the man had guts. He backed his own findings with his own reputation. He was prepared to take the risk in order to get this truth out to the world, and he deserves recognition for that. I would say that Charles Hapgood was a first-class researcher who checked and double-checked and triple-checked every single fact before he put it down in writing. This man was a meticulous researcher, and he's been underestimated for far too long. It's high time that the scientific establishment went back and re-examined the incredible body of evidence that Hapgood put together and has left for us to make sense of today. Why isn't Hapgood's theory of crustal displacement widely accepted today? The geological establishment has uh, a reluctance uh, to accept uh, new ideas. This has been the case all the way down the line. An example is Alfred Wegener in uh, 1916, who advanced the theory of continental drift. At the time, he was ridiculed as a madman. Today, continental drift is taught as orthodoxy in all our schools. And I think it's the same with, with Hapgood. It's going to take a number more years to pass before the geological authorities are prepared to admit that he could be right. All over the world, we find traces of what I call the fingerprints of the gods. The echoes, the memories, the monuments left behind by a civilization that has not been identified by historians. But the great problem is that all we find are these faint hints and traces. We find the fingerprints but we don't find the body. Now, coming down to us from the remote past is a whole category of legends, of which the most famous is the legend of Atlantis. 
that speaks of a continent on which a great advanced civilization existed long ages ago. The problem with the whole notion of Atlantis and what's really scuppered it as a workable theory up to now has been the fact that nowhere around the earth has anybody been able to find any traces of a lost continent. The idea that it's on the ocean bottoms doesn't work because the ocean bottoms have all been mapped and there's no lost continents down there either in the Atlantic or in the Pacific or anywhere else. Canadian researchers Rand and Rose Flemath came up with an answer to this problem which I personally find very convincing and which ties in very closely to the theory of earth crust displacement. Their answer to the problem is very simple. They say that the lost continent of Atlantis is actually Antarctica and that it's under two miles of ice at the South Pole that we are going to find the great engineering works, the harbors, the buildings, the libraries of this lost civilization. That's where we're going to find the body, as it were, instead of just the fingerprints. Would you, what would you like to see now? Would you like to see somebody mount an expedition and go look for it? <coughs> we're running? Yes. I think uh, that it's very important uh, that these ideas should be taken seriously. We're operating in the realm of theory here. Uh, this is how human knowledge moves forwards, and theories can be tested. The theory that there may be the remains of a great lost civilization lying under the ice in Antarctica is a theory that can be tested. We have the technology and the ability to do it. All that it requires is the political and economic will to go to Antarctica and to use the latest techniques to look under the ice and see what's there. I think we should look. I think the case is compelling enough to justify scientific investment in this research. All over the world there are monuments that are rather like uh, Stonehenge. What, what they have in common uh, is extremely accurate astronomical alignments and also a tendency for them to be built out of really very large blocks of stone. In the case of Stonehenge, most of the blocks weigh under 100 tons, and we could lift those blocks today. But there are other sites where blocks of 300 or even 400 tons in weight have been built up into intricate jigsaw puzzle walls. Theories have been advanced as to how these walls were built. Most cases, those theories have been advanced by people without experience in engineering. And when you talk to engineers about putting together walls made of three or 400 ton blocks of stone, they'll tell you very honestly, they just don't know how it was done. What all these uh, ancient sites uh, say, their, their testimony, if you like, uh, is that ancient man, going back thousands of years before our time, was far, far more sophisticated than we're prepared to give credit for. That there was a civilization that was capable of mapping the heavens and the earth as accurately as we can ourselves today. That there was a civilization that was capable of lifting weights so heavy that even with the latest technology we ourselves would find it very difficult to do the same job. The question that, that comes to my mind is how long are we going to go on closing our eyes to the possibility of a huge forgotten episode in human history, to the possibility that the historians haven't got it all quite right? to the possibility that we may be a species with amnesia, and that there may be something in our past, a great lost civilization, as all the myths and legends say, that we haven't yet come to terms with at all. I get the feeling that all over the world, people have become dissatisfied with the sterile, dry, and frankly meaningless answers to the great mysteries of life that are given by science and by history. More and more people, and I would say it runs into tens and perhaps even hundreds of millions around the world, are increasingly aware that we are a much more, much more mysterious species than we give ourselves credit for, and that there are many more mysteries and secrets in our past than we are prepared to accept at the moment. And this intuitive sense that people have is driving them to re-examine the past of the human race, whether or not the historians and the scientists want to do it. The people themselves are leading the way in this quest for the truth about our own past.
what's uh, happening here is that intelligent people, ordinary members of the general public, who should never be underestimated, are themselves completely dissatisfied with the picture of the past that is being given to them. More and more evidence is coming out, and very gradually, very slowly, but very surely, this evidence is beginning to overwhelm the old historical model that we've been living with. Now, it's natural enough that those who have a vested interest in the existing historical model, for example, historians, Egyptologists, archaeologists, are going to be extremely reluctant to let it go because they're blowing away their own careers when they do that. And this is why the move in this direction is coming from the general public who are seeing the new evidence, who are putting two and two together and realizing that the answers are not provided by orthodox history and who are actively seeking for an answer to the whole problem. I would say that it's most important of all to question authority. Actually, it's very clear, if we look at the history of, of science, even within recorded history, we can see that the great advances in science have always been made against a background of enormous resistance from the quote-unquote establishment. If we just blindly accept what the so-called authorities tell us, then we'll never make any kind of progress in ideas. It's essential to keep an open mind to all possibilities and not to be bound down by theories and ideas put forward by an entrenched establishment who have a vested interest in those very theories and ideas. I wrote Fingerprints of the Gods because I wasn't satisfied with the answers that were being given to me to a huge series of mysteries around this planet. Most mysterious of all, a series of ancient sites uh, that have never been properly explained by historians. These sites I think of literally as the fingerprints of the gods, as marks left on our planet by a lost civilization that we have not yet properly identified. And amongst those sites, two in particular are extremely interesting. One is Giza in Egypt, where the Great Pyramids and the Sphinx stand. And on the other side of the Atlantic, on the other side of the world, is Tiwanaku in the high Andes in Bolivia, possibly the oldest city ever been built, the oldest city surviving to this day. Archaeologists tell us that Tiwanaku dates to just 500 AD. On what is this theory based? It's based on the carbon dating of organic artifacts found buried around the gigantic stones out of which Tiwanaku is built. That's like saying that uh, we can date Westminster Cathedral in London, which was built hundreds of years ago, uh, on the basis of somebody buried in it ten years ago. It's uh, completely illogical. Tiwanaku is an extraordinary site. It's built of gigantic blocks of stone, which in some cases weigh more than 400 tons each. It's astronomically aligned with enormous precision. And when we do the astronomical calculations on Tiwanaku, we find that what those alignments are telling us is that this city was laid out 15,000 years ago, at least 15,000 years ago. And that also ties in with the geology of the site, because it's very clear, and even orthodox archaeologists don't dispute this, that Tiwanaku was built as a port on the shores of Lake Titicaca. Now, Lake Titicaca today is almost 15 miles away from Tiwanaku and more than 100 feet lower. Of course, different lakes lose their water level at different rates, but I've talked to experts from the British Geological Survey who are working in that area at the moment. And they tell me that for Lake Titicaca to have declined as much as it has from the edge of the city of Tiwanaku would have taken at the very least 10,000 years to happen. So it seems sometimes that the geologists and the archaeologists don't compare notes on these problems. And perhaps if they did, we'd begin to get a better idea of what really went on in our own past. Situated at an altitude of 12,500 feet above sea level, Tiwanaku in the high Andes in Bolivia is one of the strangest and most mysterious sites in the world, a site that may have been very wrongly dated 
by conventional archaeologists working in that area. Around about the turn of the century, a great Bolivian scholar called Arthur Poznanski, a professor at La Paz University, began a 50-year study of the ruins of Tiwanaku. Year in, year out, no matter what the conditions, no matter what the weather, Poznanski was up there excavating, measuring, carefully calculating the alignments of the site. And as a result of that 50 years of work, he came up with an extraordinary conclusion. He concluded on the basis of astronomical alignments that Tiwanaku had been laid out more than 15,000 years ago, long before any civilization known to history is ever supposed to have existed. When the uh, Spanish first arrived uh, in South America, they asked the, the local people, the Incas at that time, who, who built this incredible city of Tiwanaku with these gigantic blocks of stone? Did you build it? The Incas said no. In fact, they laughed at the idea. They said, we had nothing to do with this. This was built thousands of years before our time. It was built, they said, by gods or, or demigods, who they called the Viracochas, bearded, pale-skinned men who came from across the seas, they said, in a time of darkness and turmoil, when civilization had been destroyed, to restore the health of society, to bring back culture to a devastated land. And all the legends and traditions state that it was these mysterious bearded strangers long ages ago who built the city of Tiwanaku. The best bet is that the, the powerful statue, uh, the middle of the three pillars in the subterranean uh, temple in Tiwanaku, is an image of this bearded civilizing hero, Viracocha. Certainly the beard is very evident uh, on the face, and the features of the face in no way resemble the features of uh, a native uh, of that area. He looks like a foreigner, and in fact, so much was he remembered to have looked like a foreigner that when the Spanish first arrived in South America, bearded, pale-skinned, coming from across the sea by boat, exactly as Viracocha was said to have come in all the legends, the local people at first welcomed the Spaniards, believing that they were the gods returning. But unlike the Viracochas, who brought only good things with them and who tried to create civilization and a prosperous and worthwhile society. The bearded Spaniards who came to South America destroyed everything that they found in their way. They obliterated almost all traces of the ancient civilizations that had lived in that area. They wiped clean one of the memory banks of mankind. Is the upper statue also Viratoche? It's been speculated that the, uh, the statue on the uh, side of the Gateway of the Sun also represents Viracocha. All of this uh, is speculation because we have no records coming down to us from this period. But uh, it is a great mystery to find on these extraordinarily ancient monuments the images of a type of people who should not have been present, according to conventional history, in the Americas at that time. Well, who was Viracocha and where did he come from? My own view is that Viracocha uh, was one of the survivors of a great lost civilization of high antiquity that was destroyed in an enormous global cataclysm. I think there were a number of survivors, and all around the world we find memories of people like him, tall, bearded people. Quetzalcoatl in Mexico is another example. Osiris in Egypt is another example. I've made a very close study of the symbolism of all of these figures, and they have a remarkable amount in common, much more than can be explained by coincidence. I think we're, what we're looking at here are very ancient memories of a people from a civilization as yet unidentified by history, who sought to keep the light of knowledge burning in a devastated world. It's long been noticed that there are curious similarities between the very ancient historical cultures of Mexico, of the Andes, and of Egypt, and other places around the world as well, quite distant and scattered places. 
And it's been suggested from time to time that maybe these have resulted from some kind of direct influence of Egypt on Mexico or of South America on Egypt or so on and so forth. My own view is that what we're looking at here is a common influence that touched all of these places long before recorded history began. A remote third-party civilization unidentified by historians that had a presence in Mexico, that had a presence in South America, that had a presence in Egypt and elsewhere, and that left behind a legacy of knowledge in all of those places. That legacy was then reinterpreted and developed and used in different ways by the different peoples, but still, even to this day, we find those common elements, and I think they all go back to a common source. There are so many strange similarities linking ancient Egypt, ancient South America, ancient Central America as well. Um, one of the best examples is, is the kind of stonework that was used, very large blocks of stone put together with extraordinary complexity in very finely built walls with joints so precisely aligned that you can't even slip a piece of paper into those joints uh, today. This architecture looks very similar in the different parts of the world, and yet there's supposed to have been no contact between these ancient civilizations. It seems to me that the answer to this problem lies in an even more ancient civilization, which passed down a legacy of architectural knowledge to all these widely scattered areas of the globe. And it's that common legacy that explains the common points and similarities better than any other theory that I've come across. What I think of as one of the architectural fingerprints of the gods uh, is a certain way of working with stone. Uh, for example, carrying blocks around a corner in an L shape uh, is a very extraordinary way of building. And we find this, uh, for example, in the Bali Temple next door to the Sphinx at Giza. And we find it in pre-Inca architecture all over the Andes in South America. Uh, to me, the best expl explanation uh, for this common method of building, and very unusual method of building on both sides of the Atlantic, is that it's the result of a common architectural legacy handed on to both of these areas by a remote civilization not yet identified by history. And what I see in that architecture is the architecture of cataclysm. This seems to have been an architecture that was designed to withstand the most horrendous geological shocks, huge earthquakes, disasters of that kind, this type of architecture is capable of riding out the worst earthquake that you can imagine. So it seems to have been devised by a people who needed to deal with very bad earthquakes. And we find that architecture in Egypt and in South America still surviving to this day. It's pretty clear to me from the evidence that a common legacy of architectural knowledge was passed down from remote prehistory and spread out in very widely scattered locations around the world. And what all this architecture has in common um, is enormous stability. I think of it as the architecture of cataclysm, architecture that was created by a people who had passed through an enormous disaster and who had survived that disaster, a great movement of the earth, as all the legends say, who wanted to build monuments that could never be destroyed by no matter how great the earthquake was. And also a people who, who had a fixation with predicting when such a cataclysm might occur again, and who seemed to have looked to the skies and to the stars to find a way of calculating when the next disaster would occur. Ask yourself this. If you belonged to a high civilization that had just been almost completely obliterated by a gigantic geological cataclysm, a movement of the crust of the earth, what would you set out to do in the future? First of all, you would set out to create buildings that were extremely stable, that would survive the worst imaginable earthquake. And that's what we find in these fingerprints of a lost architectural knowledge all around the world. A fixation, a desire to create buildings that would last forever, no matter what happened to them. 
And another thing that we find is a focus on trying to predict when the cataclysm will recur. What has come down to us from the ancient past seems to be a message that by a close study of astronomical phenomena, it is possible to predict when the Earth will again be visited by this all-destroying cataclysm. And the eeriest thing of all is that there's a convergence of ancient mythology from all around the world. The best-known example is the Mayan calendar from Central America, which tells us very precisely that there's going to be another great movement of the Earth on the 23rd of December in 2012 AD in our calendar. All of this based on very careful astronomical observations. Now, I'm not saying that the ancient myths are right. What I am saying is that we would be stupid if we didn't at least listen to this testimony that has been passed down to us from a remote time and a testimony that bears the fingerprints of scientific thinkers, not primitive savages. The prime meridian at uh, Greenwich is, is me measured with the, the latest uh, modern techniques and, and, and beside the meridian line there stands a meridian building uh, which is uh, oriented north, south, east and west. The interesting thing about this building, although it incorporates all the latest knowledge, is that it is in fact nine sixtieths of a degree off true north and that's about the best we can do uh, with our culture. If you go to Egypt and go to the Great Pyramid, which is not just any little building, which is a six million ton building, and which is at the very least four and a half thousand years old and perhaps much older, you find that it is just three sixtieths of a degree off true north. Now what this tells us is that the people who built the Great Pyramid were people with advanced scientific knowledge with the ability to express that knowledge with incredible precision in the most remarkable monument that has ever been built on the face of this earth. We're told by Egyptologists that that monument, perfectly oriented due north, south, east and west, was built simply to satisfy the ego of some pharaoh of the fourth dynasty as his tomb. Everything about the monument proclaims the opposite conclusion, that it could never have been a tomb, and that whatever its purpose and function is, it was not to satisfy the ego of an individual pharaoh, whose name is not even inscribed upon it in any place. This is a work of science and intelligence left for future generations to puzzle out. Not only is it perfectly oriented to the north, it also stands on latitude 30, exactly one-third of the way between the North Pole and the equator. Again, the Egyptologists would like us to believe that this is the result of coincidence. I think this defies common sense, and more and more people are unwilling to accept such an idea about the Great Pyramid. If it stands on latitude 30, then it does so because its builders deliberately put it there. For several hundred years, a, a, a model of what mankind is and of what the Earth is has been steadily building up, I would say since the Renaissance and, and perhaps even before. Uh, and this is the, the prevailing model that we, that we live with today. Academic specialists, whether they're scientists, physicists, geologists, Egyptologists working in the realm of history, archaeologists, all have a vested intellectual interest in the existing model because that is what their careers are based on. They've grown up with that model. They took it in with their mother's milk. They themselves teach it in universities to other students. For such people, human nature being what it is, it's very easy to understand why they find it extremely difficult to deal with evidence which contradicts that model in which they have such a strong personal investment. And it's natural that they should seek to ignore or discount or even ridicule 
that evidence. But we're getting to a situation now where the evidence is piling up and piling up and piling up. And the old model is becoming increasingly untenable. The great challenge for the future is for people to open their minds again to all possibilities and not to desperately defend a view of the past that just doesn't work anymore. But I'm afraid the last people who are going to be prepared to open their minds to that possibility are the scientists and the historians who are tied in to the existing model. What I sense, uh, particularly with uh, Egyptologists, uh, is a kind of desperation or, or fear. Um, they themselves can't be completely blind to the new evidence that's coming up that, that, that contradicts the model that they've been working with. But they realize that if they admit even one tiny point of that new evidence, that that's going to be the thin end of the wedge, which is going to overturn the whole model on which their careers are based, and also their whole idea of what the past of mankind is. It's extremely difficult psychologically for anybody to accept such a revolutionary overturn of everything that they hold to be true, and it's natural that they should resist as strongly as possible the new ideas that are coming up. But these aren't just ideas. This is evidence, evidence from all over the world which casts doubt on the old model. And that's why people are increasingly turning away from the orthodox authorities and reading books like uh, Fingerprints of the Gods uh, to find answers to the mysteries that puzzle them as well. The, uh, the, the, the model of the old world and the new world is deeply rooted in the conventional historical view that uh, America was discovered in 1492 by people from Europe and that that's when its history uh, begins, although of course we know that the Americas were inhabited for long, long periods before that. But what nobody has ever considered is the possibility that there may have been an earlier world altogether, a civilization on this planet way before what we call history began in that deep, dark period called prehistory from which no records have come down. A civilization that knew the world as well as we do ourselves and, and, and which did not divide it into categories of, of old and new, but that left its traces everywhere for us to rediscover today. I am convinced by the evidence that we are a species with amnesia. We have forgotten something of great importance from our own past. And I think in that terrible forgetfulness, we may find the explanation for why we're so confused, so disturbed, so mixed up, so lacking in direction as we face the coming millennium. There's a real sense of disorientation spreading around the world. And I think the only way that we're going to overcome that is to recover this incredibly important episode from our own past that we've kind of blanked out and forgotten. When we recover it, we'll realize for a start that our civilization isn't the apex of creation. It isn't the pinnacle towards which everything has been building throughout all of geological time. Rather, it's part of an up and down, a flow in history that goes on of civilizations, that it's possible for a civilization to reach a very high level of advancement and be wiped out. This is something we've never really confronted and we need to confront it, that a great civilization of the past was so completely destroyed that almost no traces of it are left. The same thing could happen to us. This knowledge should teach us humility. I think what has happened, uh, and it's a process that's taken hundreds of years to come uh, to fruition, is a growing dissatisfaction with all the old answers that have been given to us. Conventional religion no longer works. It doesn't provide us with the explanations we need to make sense of what we see going on around us. Science doesn't give us any meaning in our lives at all. It wants to reduce everything to accidental collections of molecules. 
there's a profound dissatisfaction with that and a, and a strong feeling that there must be something more and people are searching for this. History doesn't give us the answer either. It envisages a straightforward, linear evolution of society from primitive to advanced today. And yet, all of us grew up in our childhood hearing the myths and legends of the Golden Age, and we have a sense that there may be truth in those myths and legends, a truth that history just hasn't come to terms with at all. shows Antarctica and it shows South America and Africa in perfect relative longitudes. The map incorporates a high degree of geographical and scientific knowledge and as Piri Reis himself told us that knowledge was not his knowledge, it was knowledge that he borrowed and copied from earlier maps. So the mystery is where did these source maps come from? Who charted the globe long ages ago with an accuracy that we ourselves can hardly match today? According to historians, uh, no map should have been able to incorporate accurate longitudes before the late 18th century. Yet these ancient maps show that it was done. And this is a fact that we're confronted with, whether historians like it or not. And confronted by that fact, we have to make certain deductions from it. And the, the clearest deduction of all is that whoever drew up those original source maps thousands of years ago had a level of technology as high as our own. They had explored the whole globe from north to south and from east to west. They knew the exact location of all the continents and land masses. And they were able to map them with precise, accurate longitudes, which we ourselves couldn't do until at least the 18th century. So this is testimony of an advanced and as yet unidentified civilization in remote prehistory. The Piri Reis map uh, definitely shows uh, the northern coastline of Antarctica, of the Antarctic uh, Peninsula, and, and perhaps the greatest mystery of all uh, is that it shows the Antarctic Peninsula, not as it looks today, covered by more than a mile of the planet, is a relatively recent one. Prior to the 18th century, ships were constantly being wrecked on coasts because the navigators had no idea within a hundred miles to west or east of exactly where they were, and it led to the most horrendous uh, accidents and disasters. And what it took to overcome this problem was the invention of an extremely accurate marine chronometer, a timepiece that could keep accurate time at sea. This was the essential thing, and we didn't have such a chronometer until late in the 18th century. But the mystery that arises from this is that ancient maps have come down to us from thousands and thousands of years ago, which incorporate astonishingly accurate longitudes and relative longitudes, placing, for example, the continent of South America and Africa in accurate relative longitudes, as accurate as we can manage today. Now, as far as our historians are concerned, this should not have been possible before the 18th century, and yet these maps are testimony to an earlier civilization that was able to do longitudes as well as we can do them today. In 1929, rolled up on a dusty shelf in a library in Constantinople in Turkey, a map was found. This map had been drawn in 1513 by a Turkish admiral, Admiral Piri Reis. And he stated on the map that it was based on more than 20 source maps 
and that some of these maps went back to the time of Alexander the Great or even earlier, in other words, to before the time of Christ. The strange thing about this map is it shows features of the earth that nobody in 1513, let alone thousands of years previously, should have ice. But as it actually looks, underneath that covering of ice. Now we ourselves have only known what the land under the Antarctic Peninsula really looks like since 1958 when seismic surveys were taken across the ice cap. The mystery of this map is it shows Antarctica as it looks under the ice long before Antarctica is even supposed to have been discovered and the Piri Reis map isn't alone. It's one of a category of maps that focus on Antarctica. The famous uh, geographer Mercator in the 16th century provided us with an accurate map of Antarctica 300 years before Antarctica was discovered and he too said that his information was based on earlier sources. Orontius Phineas provided a map of Antarctica showing mountains along the coast with rivers running down from those mountains into the sea in places where huge glaciers stand today. And perhaps the most amazing map of all was drawn by Philippe Bouache, a French cartographer in the 18th century, again based on earlier source maps, which gives us an almost perfect rendering of the whole continent of Antarctica as it actually looks underneath the ice. Now in this there lies a great, great mystery. The implications of these maps are truly enormous. We're faced with one of two propositions. Geologists tell us that Antarctica has been covered with ice for at least three million years. This is the orthodox geological opinion. In that case, we're obliged to accept that Antarctica was mapped accurately more than three million years ago, when we ourselves uh, as a species are not even supposed to have existed on this planet. Alternatively, there's a possibility that the geologists are wrong. They've been wrong before, and it's possible that they're wrong about this. All over the world, dating from a remote and mysterious period of prehistory for which no records have come down to us, there are monuments like this. These monuments have a number of things in common. First and foremost, enormous blocks of stone, gigantic, weighing hundreds of tons. Secondly, very precise scientific astronomical alignments. And thirdly, the greatest mystery of all, we don't know who built these monuments. We don't know when they were built. We don't know why they were built. And in most cases, we have absolutely no idea how they were built. Historians and archaeologists present us with a kind of sanitized view of the past. We're presented with a picture of the past as though everything's sewn up and sorted out and everybody knows exactly what's happened. But if you go into this in depth, as I have done, what you find is that these historical opinions are pure speculation. They're not based on solid evidence at all. A monument like this one, made of stone, cannot be dated by any conventional means. All you have are the opinions of scholars. And whether it's here in England or in Egypt or in South America, the problem remains the same. Massive, completely anonymous monuments about which we know nothing, around which historians and archaeologists have elaborated fanciful theories based on absolutely no evidence whatsoever. 
All that we know about the people who built these monuments is what we can deduce from the monuments themselves. And if we look at these monuments with open minds and open eyes, we find something very interesting. Firstly, that the level of technology involved in creating them was high, the lifting and maneuvering of these huge blocks of stone. And secondly, that they incorporated fantastically accurate astronomical alignments, which could only have been the result of a very accurate observational science. So this is what the monuments tell us. They tell us that the people who built them were serious and intelligent people with a scientific outlook on life. And that's the testimony of the monuments. And no matter what the historians or the archaeologists say, the monuments continue to tell us that story. Tourists come from all over the world to be photographed at Greenwich, standing astride the Prime Meridian with one foot in the Western Hemisphere and one foot in the Eastern Hemisphere. They know exactly where they are on the planet. The science of determining exactly where we stand on the planet